empower Smith students to create a better world through business. And we are so excited to hear uh, Professor Edmonds' take and research regarding growing the pie and how profit and purpose are not mutually exclusive. Uh, during this presentation, we will be recording this event and it will be posted to the Smith School's YouTube page. If you do not wish to be part of the recording, you can leave the WebEx right now, but this re recording will be, but this WebEx will both be recorded and published. If you have any questions that you did not submit ahead of time in the registration, at the bottom right, there is a Q&A box. Please send any questions you have to the Q&A box, not the chat box. Um, I will now pass it over to Russ Wormers, the Bank of America Professor of Finance and Director for the Center for Financial Policy. Uh, take it away, Russ. Thanks, Nima, and thanks to the CSVC uh, Center for Social Value Creation at the Smith School of Business for co-hosting. We're thrilled. Uh, great to have this new alliance. I'm Russ Warmers. I am uh, director of the Center for Financial Policy, another center of excellence. Thank you, Nima, at the University of Maryland Smith School of Business. Um, our uh, our mission at the CFP um, is to both uh, broadcast out. We have a deep Rolodex of uh, regulators, uh, academics, and professionals in the industry. Um, so our, our role, the way I see our role in uh, the Smith School and in the broader Washington, D.C. area is to broadcast out our research and our thoughts to uh, the community uh, and also to uh, listen uh, to the community about the things that they think uh, need to be studied, about the thoughts uh, that they have about uh, research of ours and our affiliated academics and other people that we invite to conferences and seminars. So uh, being in the D.C. area, I think, is really a, a natural uh, for our center, and, and we uh, have done, I think, a, a pretty good job of uh, taking advantage of it. Today is no exception. Um, we have been able to um, recruit or twist arms of um, uh, Professor Alex Edmonds, who is a young, young and superstar uh, professor of finance. Um, he tells he told me earlier or on the last call that he's not as young as he used to be. I guess that's a pathology, but I don't believe it. You know, he seems to be as young as he used to be. I don't know what he does. But uh, he is a very, don't, don't let his uh, looks uh, and his uh, youth uh, 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 um, uh, mislead you. He, has, uh, he is a superstar in research. He uh, mainly has done, had many contributions in the area of corporate finance, uh, governance, um, um, uh, executive compensation, uh, lots of other areas. And now he's uh, working, uh, in addition to those areas, he's working on social, uh, social responsibility, ESG, things like that, and that's what the topic of his uh, talk will be today. Um, Alex is Professor of Finance at the London Business School. He is uh, Mercer School Memorial Professor of Business at Gresham College, which he told me shortly before this uh, webinar is, is a, a place where um, uh, well-regarded um, academics uh, make talks um, and distribute uh, uh, talks and, and uh, lectures, which is, uh, which is totally to be expected with Alex. He's academic director of the Center for Corporate Governance um, at, at the uh, London Business School, and he is managing editor for one of our very top uh, finance scholarly journals, The Review of Finance. Um, he also has a couple of TED Talks, and I've seen one of them, and it's just wonderful. So it, it's obvious that uh, he has a lot of wisdom to share, and, uh, and I'd like to turn it over to Alex uh, now. Well, welcome, Alex Edmonds, Professor Edmonds. Well, thanks so much for us. Thank you, Nima. Thank you, Chris. It's, it's great to be hosted by the CFP and the CSVC. And thank you to everybody for attending. There's lots going on in the world right now, but thank you for your interest in this topic. So what I'm going to speak about is responsible business in a time of crisis. And I think in order to do that, I will start by explaining, well, what I mean by business to begin with, because even though it might seem to be something with a clear definition, Actually, my view on this topic might be different from what is traditionally thought. So in the UK, we've been in lockdown for, I think it's three months now, and it might be similar in the US or wherever you've been around the world. So let me at least take you metaphorically outside your home offices on a journey. So I'd like to take you to the Great Rift Valley. So this stretches across two continents, for 6,000 kilometers from Lebanon in Asia to Mozambique in Africa. It has some of the world's highest mountains 
and it has some of the world's deepest lakes. So, and one of these lakes is a lake called Lake Magadi, which is on the southernmost tip of the Great Rift Valley. Now, you might think it's hard for you to imagine that you're here. I'm just showing you a, a picture. But some of you might have actually seen it before on the bigger screen in a movie called The Constant Gardener, based on a John Le Carré novel of the same name. And indeed, millions of people around the world have seen Lake because of this movie. But fewer than a thousand people call Magadi their home. And one of these people is a gentleman called Emmanuel Sura, who makes a living selling and herding goats. Now, for Emmanuel, it used to be that cash was king. It was cash that he'd get if he sold a goat. He'd have to check that cash in case it was forged. He'd have to store that cash and risk getting robbed. And then to bank that cash, it wasn't just to walk down the high street. He had to trek for one whole day to the nearest bank. And as a consequence, he couldn't graze his goats in the greenest pastures. He had to be within one day. And so his life was really tough. That changed in 2007, thanks to what I would call a responsible business. And that company was Vodafone, which is the UK telecoms operator. So as some of you might know, Vodafone launched M-Pesa, which is a mobile money service in Kenya. So let me take a short while to explain what mobile money is, because some of us think it's mobile banking. But well, I have a Bank of America account and I can operate it on my phone rather than go down the high street. But in fact, with mobile money, you don't even need to have a bank account to begin with. And that was really important because many Kenyans just did not have access to banking. So this has transformed the life of a man. He no longer needs to worry about cash and he can graze his goats on the greenest pastures. He doesn't need to be close to a bank. And his accounting is easy, right? On his phone, he's got a record of every transaction. But as we know, as centres and as academics, we don't want to just over extrapolate from one story. Indeed, there was a study by MIT professor Tavnit Suri that the launch of MPEGA lifted 200,000 households out of poverty. And importantly, many of these households were headed by women because it allowed them to move from agriculture to business and retail, so it had a big effect on gender parity. So that was one story that I have about Vodafone. But let me tell you another story. And this story is about tax. Vodafone became the first telecoms company worldwide to release a tax transparency report showing how much tax they were paying to governments around the world. And that's really important because in the telecoms industry, you could choose to locate your licenses in low tax countries. It's easy to legally avoid tax. So I've got two questions for everybody on this webinar to think about. So the first is which of these decisions created most value for society? And the second is which of these decisions, if they hadn't been taken, would have led to the most public outrage or worsened Vodafone's corporate social responsibility, rating or reputation. Now, I'm not going to poll anybody because I'm pretty sure that everybody would agree with the answer. So which decision created most value? It was the first one. By launching Mpesa, 200,000 households got lifted out of poverty in Kenya. But what would have been the media backlash if Vodafone hadn't launched Mpesa? It would have been nothing, but right? you don't get into trouble for not innovating, right? The media wouldn't give you a backlash because they wouldn't have even that it was possible to have this crazy idea of banking without a bank. But what would be the media backlash for not being transparent about tax? Well, that's massive. And in fact, two years previously, Vodafone did suffer that backlash. So in 2002, UK Uncut, which is a UK citizens group, reported that Vodafone had legally, although not morally, avoided £6 billion of tax. And it was just a coincidence that at the same time, the Chancellor, George Osborne, unveiled £6 billion of spending cuts. 
So you can imagine the headlines, but you, the taxpayer, is suffering austerity because of this greedy, irresponsible company avoiding tax. And we know what the outcome of this story is, right? It's some customer boycotts. And so that was extremely damaging to Vodafone's reputation. So this is why my view of responsible business differs from maybe many traditional views. So most people responsibility as the second question, right? We do no harm. Like Google's motto was do no evil for many, many years. We don't mistreat our workers. We don't cheat on tax. We don't price gouge customers. We don't pollute the environment. And don't get me wrong, all of those things are important, but you didn't need to give up your time to give on, come on this webinar to hear that. Like most people know that responsible business is about do no harm. But what I want to do is to give a different shift in thinking is to elevate the idea of responsible business. It's not only about do no harm, it's about actively doing good through innovation and excellence, something like m -Pesa. And so that goes to the framework that I introduced in the book that uh, was mentioned, which is I view the value that a company creates as being given by a pie. And that pie can be given either to investors in the form of profits or society in the form of value. So this is wages to workers or uh, great products to customers or taxes to the government. And the traditional view is that responsibility is about splitting the pie fair. So we want to here. And so that's more equitable, it's seen as fair. And again, don't get me wrong, like fairness is important. But I would say that the view of responsibility as being about splitting the pie is limited for at least two reasons. So the first reason is that it's bad for the company, it reduces profits. And so if that's the case, then CEOs won't want to voluntarily put it into practice. For example, in the US last August, 181 CEOs signed that business roundtable statement saying that they were gonna serve wider society but many of them have been accused of not putting it into practice. And you can see why, because if serving society means increasing the orange and reducing the blue, then many people won't voluntarily do it. And the second reason why the splitting the pie is not the best view of responsibility is that it's bad for investors. Now, many people might say, I don't care, right? Because we often like to portray investors as nameless, faceless capitalists, they are them and society is us. So if we can take from them and give to us, that's better for society. But that's not right because investors are not them. They are us. They include parents saving for their children's education. They include pension funds saving for retirement. They include insurance companies funding their future claims. So any repurposing of business needs to take investors seriously. It can't simply be taken away from them. So that's my, my, why my view of responsible business is about growing the pie. So we absolutely do want to increase the orange, but we do this not by giving them more of what's already there, by splitting the pie like this, but through innovation and excellence, actively creating value. For example, with Vodafone, they launched Mpesa genuinely to serve a social need, not to make money, but ultimately they were able to benefit and monetize it as a byproduct. So that's why my view of responsible business, I called it pie economics. Now you could love or you could hate that phrase, but regardless of whether you like or dislike it, let me explain what I mean by it. It seeks to create profits only through creating value for society. So let me pick apart this definition. Right, those last four words should be uncontroversial. Responsibility is about creating value for society. But the important thing here is they create profits through creating value for society. So we do this not just through corporate philanthropy and donations, but by solving social problems in profitable ways because investors are important. And the second thing is the word only, 
Why? Because one way to create profits is through extracting from society. So Martin Shkreli of Turing Pharmaceuticals bought drugs, hiked the prices by 55 times, made profits, but extracting from society. But this only means that you're creating profits as a byproduct of solving social problems, for example, manufacturing products that genuinely address consumer needs or providing em employees with a healthy and enriching workplace. Now, at this point, you might think, well, everything Alex says sounds great, but it's just too good to be true. Right? Where is the evidence? Uh, yes, it would be great if companies that treated their workers better or served society magically became more profitable in the bottom line, but that just seems like a fairy tale. So this is indeed why what Ross and I and many other academics do is to try to look at some rigorous research around this. And I think it's particularly important to be sceptical because of this concern of confirmation bias. So that's the idea that people accept evidence if it confirms what we would like to be true. So we've seen this in the pandemic. So people who would like to support the lockdown would show some studies showing that if we didn't have the lockdown, more people would die. And others who don't want the lockdown will just find some evidence in the other direction. And I think this is a particular issue with responsible business because we would like it to be the case that ethical companies do better. So we might latch on to any evidence that suggests that, even though it's not rigorous. And the talk that Russ kindly mentioned, it's called What to Trust in a Post-Truth World, about how we need to be really rigorous and discerning about evidence rather than just immediately accepting what sounds good. And I'm not going to go into that today because um, that the, it's available if people want to take a look. But instead, let me just have one slide explaining why this is serious for the topic of the day, which is responsibility. So I'm taking Forbes, which is a really reliable source. It quoted a study saying that companies that excel in sustainability outperform their peers. So sustainable companies perform better. Nothing wrong with that paragraph. But here's the concern, it's the next paragraph. That is the premise of a new report, and it is an accurate one. Judging by many conversations with those interested in better business and a sustainable future. So how does the journalist judge whether the report is accurate? Not by scrutinizing its scientific methodology or its rigor, but just by asking people who believe in responsible business, do you think it's true? And obviously they will say yes. So this is where we want to be a bit careful. So I wanted to look at this myself. Are companies that serve society, do they actually do better in terms of the bottom line? And in order to do that, we need to measure how well a company serves society. And that's really tricky, right? Because you could sign a business roundtable statement, but not actually put it into practice. So what I wanted to look at is not statements, but actually outcomes. So I chose to look at employee satisfaction, so how well a company treats its workers. And, and why did I choose to look at that? Right, because you might think the environment matters or maybe tax matters, but I chose to look at workers because I had a very good data source available. And that's the 100 best companies to work for in America. So why is that list so good? It's for two reasons. So first is that it was available from 1984, so I had tons of data. Now, ESG is a pretty new phenomenon, and so some data sets have only been around for five or 10 years. Now, if I found a relationship for the last five or 10 years, you could be concerned that the last five to 10 years have been an economic upswing. So maybe only a relationship matters, in the up times. Maybe now, when budgets are tight, we should forget about responsibility and save money. But in the period I studied from 1984 to 2011, it included the financial crisis, included the bursting of the internet bubble, so it made sure that what I found was not specific to economic upswings. The second reason why this was a good measure is it was very thorough, so it didn't just look at quantitative factors like pay and benefits, factors like trust in management, pride in your job, 
and camaraderie with your colleagues. So I wanted to look at, well, are companies that are in this list, do they actually beat their peers or are they just fluffy companies that are distracted from the bottom line and just too much caring about their workers? Now that's the difficult thing to do because if you found a relationship, how do we know that it's employee satisfaction? For example, Google is in this list. Google's done really well, but it could just be that the tech industry has done well. It might not, it might just not be due to employee satisfaction. So for every company in this list, I had to control for what industry you're in. And there's also a research showing that companies that are small, companies that have high value, low valuation ratios, and companies with good recent performance, they typically beat the market. So I needed to make sure that um, this wasn't just firm characteristics which were driving it. And how did I do that? I used the work of Russ. So he has the benchmarks for size, book to market, and momentum. And so I compared it to the, the very benchmarks that I took from Russ's website. He generously shared that data so that other researchers like me could do this in order to control for those other factors. And I did other tests to make sure, is it correlation or causation? Is it employee satisfaction that leads to better financial performance? Or is it once the company's doing well, then it can start spending on its employees? So rather than going through all those gory details, let me just give the punchline for practitioners, which is that the 100 best companies to work for in America delivered stock returns that beat their peers by 2.3 to 3.8% per year over a 28 year period. So that's 89 to 184% cumulative. And so that serious business, right? Treating your employees well is not just fluffy, it's correlated with long-term shareholder returns. So I'm now gonna do just three quick sections as to what it means for practitioners and then open it up to questions. So the first is, what does it mean for and what does it mean for investors? So for companies, I think what this highlights is that the social value that a company creates is a CEO level issue. So I haven't used the word CSR much in this talk. And why is that? It's because corporate social responsibility often has the connotation of being a non-core activity buried in a CSR department. Whereas what this suggests is that this is something which is a CEO level issue. It is linked to a company's long-term performance. So often when I speak uh, at conferences to practitioners, people introduce me as a professor of finance and the audience does a double take. They think they've misheard because often the finance department of a company is the enemy of purpose-driven initiatives, thinking that it's a waste of money. But what the evidence suggests is that actually some purpose-driven initiatives are supportive of long-term performance rather than just being a cost center. And then second, in terms of investors, well, when I went to my first conference on responsible investing, when I was a first year assistant professor at Wharton 13 years ago, so I'm not as young as uh, Ross was kindly suggesting, um, the investors at this conference were not the mainstream investors like the Black Rocks who are now taking responsibility seriously. They were, socially responsible investors. So their goal was not just to make financial returns, but to achieve other objectives such as um, climate change. But nowadays what's interesting is that even mainstream investors care about these responsible factors. So it could be that you're an investor and your only goal is to make as much money as possible. That is a laudable goal, right? As a pension fund, you need to do that for your beneficiaries. But even so, you should still take these social factors into account. They are not financial issues, non-financial issues that are fluffy. They are ultimately financial in the long term, which is why the Black Rock and the fidelities of this world are now taking the suit. Okay. The second practitioner is, well, how do we put this into practice, right? I've said it's important. But then how do we actually deliver this when the rubber hits the road? And so what I want to do now. In the room, which is decisions. the shareholder value is no longer the only goal, but because we know how to make decisions when we're maximizing shareholder value. 
So finance professors like Russ and I have taught this for many, many decades, right? We calculate the net present value of a project. If it's positive, we take it. If it's negative, we don't. But if shareholder value is not the only objective, we need something else to guide us. So in chapter three of the book, I go through three principles which should guide a manager's investment decisions. Now, I'm not going to go through all of them in the interest of time. I'm only going to go through the third, which I'm calling the principle of materiality. So to explain this, let me first explain what I mean by purpose, because that's been a, a, a subtext to my talk, but I've never formally defined it. But often the word purposeful is assumed to mean altruistic, right? A purposeful company is one that serves society. But actually, that's not what the word purposeful means, because if we think about it semantically, purposeful means targeted and focused. So a purposeful meeting is one with an agenda. If I do something on purpose, I do it deliberately. And so what this means is that purpose cannot be all things to all people. You couldn't have a purpose to serve customers, workers, suppliers, the environment, communities, and investors. That sounds great, but that is not focused. Instead, I define purpose as the answer to the question, how is the world a better place by your company being here? It is your reason for being. So for a citizen, your purpose could be to be a professor or a doctor or a lawyer or an entrepreneur, but it wouldn't be to be all of those things. And something for a company, yes, there's all of those stakeholders that we could care about, but which are the ones that are first among equals? So let's say your energy, the French energy company, you had to make this tough decision. Do we close down Hazelwood? That's the most polluting plant in the OECD. Now, if we do that, it's good for the environment, but it's bad for workers. So if our purpose was to serve workers and the environment, that doesn't guide us in that trade off. So what I mean by materiality is, yes, all of these stakeholders are important, but who is first among equals? And what materiality means are, is there are particular stakeholders which are especially important for the company's long term. And so what I'm going to show you now is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board materiality map. So what that does is it goes through every industry and highlights which are the most material stakeholders. For example, in the first column, right, the environment matters because if there's a flood, you can't access your mind. But in the second column, we have financials, we have banks. And so, yes, climate change is a really important issue, but actually the environment doesn't matter so much for your business. What matters more? are things like customer privacy, data security, selling practices, so we don't want to be, say, in a Wells Fargo fake bank account scam. So what this means is that if you're a bank, yes, we know that climate change is the order of the day, but maybe you move the needle more by addressing social capital. And so this goes to the final I'm going to mention, which was a paper published in the Accounting Review, which took the data set from MSCI ESG, which is perhaps the best known data set for ESG performance. And it took companies that did well on every social dimension, and it found that they did not beat the market. They only beat it by one and a half percent per year, which is insignificant. But instead, they ran this again, and they looked at companies that did well on the material issues and did badly on and scaled back on the immaterial issues. And what they found was that these companies beat the market by 4.8% per year, which is significant. So that's interesting because it means that it's better to be good at only a few things than to be good at everything, right? Because if you're good at only a few things, you have some priority structure, you have some discernment. Right? So if one of your friends told you they are serving on 20 nonprofit boards, you might think that they have a time management problem. Right, we understand that with individual time management, but for some reason with companies, we assess them in a box ticking way. We expect them to solve all of the world's problems when actually what might matter is focus. And so this now takes me to the final um, section, which is how do we think about this in the crisis? 
So in the pandemic, we've seen some fantastic responses. And many of these responses are what I'm calling pie splitting. So these are companies voluntarily giving up part of the pie to help others. So there's some CEOs who are being paid nothing, like Airbus and, um, and Boeing. There's some companies which are helping out their workers. So Wynn Resorts is paying even the furloughed workers, even though the hotels are shut. And there's some companies helping their customers. So Unilever is giving 100 million euros of food and sanitizer to um, customers and communities. But the problem with pie splitting is that not everybody can split the pie. So what if you don't have 100 million euros lying around? Or what if you're not in the food and sanitizer industry? So that's why I led this talk with the importance of pie growing, of innovation and excellence, because what this means is that even if you don't have massive amounts of money, you could still serve society through being innovative. So I think the question for a business leader is what is in your hand? What resources does my company have? And how can I use them creatively to serve wider society? Just like Vodafone said, what is in my hand is connectivity and I can use this to allow people to transfer money. And so let's apply this to the crisis. So let's say you are Chelsea Football Club, right? You don't have anything clearly beneficial for the crisis. Football tickets don't seem to be useful. But what is in your hand is a hotel and they're allowing doctors and nurses to stay in that hotel after a day fighting on the front line in a hospital. And we've seen other types of pivots, such as Ford using its airbag material for masks, or perfume companies using their expertise with alcohol to instead make some sanitizer. So the second is, it's large companies that are hit by the crisis. So if you're Qantas Airways, you would love to keep paying your workers who are furloughed, but you just can't do that. That's just not commercially realistic because your revenues have been slashed. But what is in their hand? is a business relationship. And that's with a company called Woolworths, which is a grocery store. So historically, if you went to Woolworths and you bought your groceries, you could get some air miles. But they've leveraged that relationship to be something different, which is that if you're a furloughed worker from Qantas, you're being redeployed to Woolworths and so you're keeping your job. And finally, what if you're a small company? You don't have any money that you can give. So let me give you an example of a small company that I am a customer of. It's called Barry's Boot Camp. It's a brutal gym. So in London, uh, David Beckham goes to this. It was started in California. Indeed, those of you who live in DC, there's one in DuPont Circle. So obviously all of the gyms are closed, but what they are doing is they're offering free online training sessions, which is really important because many people are self-isolating at home. Well, you might think, well, that's not that innovative, right? A fitness company offering fitness classes, albeit online. But here's the great thing. What happens if you're a desk worker of the gym? You work at the reception. How can you help out in the crisis? Well, what it turns out is some of those desk workers are actors as their main job, but because acting is a volatile career, they take this desk job to provide some stable income. Now, if you are an actor, what is in your hand is you're really funny. Well, how can that help in the crisis? Well, you've got a lot of working parents with their children at home because the schools are closed. And so what Barry's Bootcam is offering is to provide online Zoom storytelling sessions for children to take the load off their parents maybe during a difficult webinar or conference call that they have. So this might seem a small thing, but what I think is great about it is just think broadly what is in our hand and how can we use this to serve one? Crisis has obviously been massively devastating. If there is a silver lining, it's about we rethink responsibility from throwing money at the problem, from splitting the pie more fairly, to being innovative and using what is in our hand to serve wider society. So I'm going to open up for questions shortly, but as, as was kindly mentioned, I just wrote a book about this um, called Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. And what led me to write this is we often think that responsibility is at the expense of profit. And so this leads to many business leaders 
being quite skeptical about it and thinking, well, we're going to do this to the minimum possible. But what I wanted to show is that even for hard headed businessmen and business women who understand the importance of being commercial, that is not consistent, not inconsistent with also being purposeful. And there's a lot of great academic evidence on this, but often academic research is written for other academics to be published in academic journals to sit in some libraries somewhere. So what I wanted to do was to take that rigorous research and to translate it into simple language for a general audience. And also on the book's website, there's been many things that obviously happened after I finished it, like the pandemic, and I'm trying to write a few blogs to, to make um, the concepts applicable for uh, the more recent events. Massive thank you to everybody for their, their attention. Um, I see that there's already some questions which have come across in, in the uh, in the Q&A, and uh, I'll just hand back to, to Russ to, to coordinate that. Oh, thank you very much, Alex. That, that was terrific, Professor Edmonds. That was terrific um, and uh, excellent in every way. Yeah, one of one of the questions that's come through is uh, how do we how are we sure that um, we're not seeing reverse causality? I hate to hit you with this identification question that I'm sure um, you you have dealt with about uh, uh, 200 times every week through your uh, executive editorship of the uh, Review of Finance. But how how are we sure that uh, Jeff Bezos is not just being nice and playing nice and doing things for society because he's been lucky enough to um, you know uh, participate in a boom in in his business? I think that's a great question, and you're absolutely right to be um, stringent and discerning about it. So th there's two reasons for why I might not have causality. So what I'm claiming is that employee satisfaction leads to better firm performance. But there's two concerns. One's reverse causality, and the other's omitted variable. So let me go through these in turn. So reverse causality is that it's firm performance that affects employee satisfaction. And so that's why I look at stock returns rather than profits, because if I look at profits, it could be in either direction. But the thing about stock returns is that's the change in the stock price from this year to next year. So let's say there was reverse causality and the company was already profitable. And that's why it's um, able to spend more on its employees. Well, if it's already profitable, its stock price would already be high, and therefore you shouldn't expect it to outperform going forwards because the stock price already takes current profitability into account. And we do recognize that the stock market is slow to react, so maybe there's a bit of momentum, but that's why the, the value of, of Russ's benchmarks, which control for momentum, are helpful. So even if you're worried that maybe profitability has not been fully incorporated, I can control for that by looking at momentum. But I think the second problem is, is even more of a concern, which is omitted variables. Maybe there's a third factor that causes both. So let's say you've got a great CEO. She both makes her workers happy because she's inspirational and she improves performance because she's a great CEO. So it's management quality, not um, employee satisfaction, which causes the better performance. So how I try to address this is with a second test, which I didn't mention in my talk, which looks at future earnings surprises of a company. So every three months in the US, companies announce their quarterly earnings. Before they do that, equity analysts like Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley predict what the earnings will be. And when they do that, they will often take management quality into account because they spend a lot of their time speaking to management. So if indeed management quality was high, right, then that should already be in the earnings forecasts. But what I find is that the earnings announcements are systematically higher than what the equity analysts were forecasting, which suggests it was something over and above um, what was in the forecast and over and above something like management quality, which they seem to, they claim to take into account. Hey, Nima, I'll, I'll hand the microphone to you if you want to ask a question that has come in prior to the, uh, the talk. Definitely. So um, there have been questions regarding ESG metrics and ratings that are provided from outside and industries, whether it's um, MSCI, uh, the organization Hydrus that Russ is working with is starting their own. There have been a few other organizations with social responsible investing and ESG metrics. You utilize the data since 1984 that has been available. However, moving forward, how would you compare the new data that is available for future studies and how do they compare to one another? Thanks. I think one of the big sort of development areas in ESG is, is the proliferation of, of now lots of great data out there. Um, so there are ESG measures for particular um, stakeholders and there's also aggregate ratings like the MSCI one that I mentioned. 
The other big concern about this is, is these ratings tend to be pretty inconsistent. So if you take two bond ratings from Standard and Poor's and Moody's, the correlation is about 0.99. But if you take two ratings from different ESG providers, the correlation is about 0.3. And so that's because different people will define responsibility in different ways. For example, let's say we want to measure gender diversity. Do we look at the number of women on the board? Do we look at the pay gap between women and men and so forth? So that's why there's a lot of inconsistency. So then what does that mean for practitioners? Because some people might think, oh, given there's so much um, lack of agreement, then we can just, it's not useful to look at any of this measure. But I don't think that's the case. I think it's still useful to look at the ratings and look at the data, but understand the what's behind them. So what are they actually measuring? rather than the headline measure of whether you're good or bad. So it's just like if we were to look at food, right, we don't just care about the total calories that the food gives, but we were to look at, well, is it from fat or is it from carbohydrates or is it from protein? Similarly, if we look at the ratings overall, we want to see, well, what's behind this? So we want to understand it in the context of the company. And I think that's actually great news for, for, for people because we often think, well, the problem with data is that it's incomparable and we need to understand it and think about the context. But that's great because if you could just take an off the shelf measure and there was a perfect measure of responsibility, we'd all be out of a job, right? Because a computer could do that, right? We could have a smart beta fund taking the one perfect measure and then just forming a strategy based on that. So the fact that we need to understand the data within the context of a company, we need to take materiality into account, that I think is good news rather than bad. So what I'm gonna put in the chat here is um, something that I um, just wrote in the blog recently, um, which is based on a paper that I didn't write, it came from people in IT, on the inconsistency of ESG ratings, but why that's not actually a bad thing, why we can actually harness it to good, because it means that we need to take the context into account, which computers can't do. Thanks, Chris. Uh, let, let me jump in here, Nima, with another question. Um, uh, this is my, my question here, I'll, I'll uh, fit it in here. Uh, anyway, uh, uh, Professor Edmonds, uh, you and I have been trained, and, we, and you're you're much more of an expert at this than I am about corporate short-termism or executive short-termism. And um, a, a good deal of this pie growing seems to me. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong, and I certainly could be. Uh, it seems to me to be um, things that will happen over the long run to a company stock price. Um, uh, and uh, executives who have a five to seven year, perhaps, uh, window that they expect to be CEO or CFO. Um, how, how can, I guess, my, my, this is an age old problem, of course, but how can uh, mechanisms be created, incentives be created for the short termism uh, type uh, executive, uh, executive, corporate executives to focus more on growing the pie? And, and as, as, as kind of a thought, you think that um, asset managers and best institutional investors are the mechanism to push them to do so. Thanks, that's another great point, because while I did mention that employee satisfaction is linked to long term performance, the big caveat is long term. So what I found is that it takes about four to five years before the effects of employee satisfaction are fully in the stock price. So if you're evaluated according to short term targets, you're not going to bother to invest in workers. So I think one of the big uh, ways to address this is CEO incentives, which is another aspect of, of my research. So CEO pay is currently really controversial, but when people think about pay reform, they focus on the level of pay or the ratio of CEO pay to median worker pay. So they'll say, let's get this down from 300 to 200. But I think what's even more important is pay. So if the CEO is given equity, that she can't sell for seven years, then this means that she does have an incentive to invest in her own employees and do a lot of these other long term effects. Whereas if she's given equity that's only uh, that's saleable within three years, she might not do that. So I think one of the big things is to try to lengthen the, the period of equity. And again, what I'm putting here in the chat is um, on my blog, I, I took a paper um, by some other faculty which um, looks at a causal link between putting in long-term pay structures and, uh, um, and performance. And notice performance here was not only financial performance, but stakeholder performance. What they find is that actually employee well-being goes up. So that suggests that the best way to make employees better is not by cutting the CEO's pay and redistributing it, i.e. splitting the pie. 
but instead giving the CEO incentives to grow the pie and that benefits workers. And then to Ross's question, you mentioned, is there a role for asset managers here? Absolutely. So what they looked at was shareholders making proposals in order to, for the firm to implement longer term pay. So as if I go to what's in your hand, Pay, you've got to sell a vote. And what I think we should be pushing for is longer term structures, not necessarily focusing only on the quantum or the ratio of pay. Great. Uh, Nima, do you, do you have another question before I dig in again? Definitely. So I had a question that was very interesting from the research you presented today. Um, there has been metrics that have come up that companies that are better in ESG or being socially responsible and growing the pie have outperformed other companies during the COVID-19 crisis. However, there's been a debate between correlation and causation of the fact that many of the companies that are withering the storm of COVID-19 are technology companies and they would outperform not due to their social responsibility, but due to their business practices about your research is you are breaking it down to comparing them to their competitors and when you did the research regarding uh employee satisfaction that two to three percent was in comparison to companies of simple si similar sizes and in industries now my question is did you notice a difference between industry return on investments when it comes to growing the pie and whether or not when you said that two to three percent of companies that are social responsible for their uh, employee satisfaction, was there a correlation due to industry or was that uh, normally distributed across different industries? Thank you. Uh, this is an important question and one that I actually found surprising results. So before I did it, I thought that I'd find the results to be stronger in human capital intensive industries, let's say pharmaceuticals or tech, where you think, well, the um, workers there are the ones coming up with the patents, so that's why it's really important to treat them well. Maybe in something like retail, where we typically think, well, the workers are, tend to be lower paid, we don't so much care about retention, I wouldn't find an effect. But actually what I found was the effect was consistent across industries, which was really surprising. In fact, when the working paper version of, of, of um, first came out, the first company to contact me was McDonald's. And you might think, well, if there's any company which is accused of having a maybe a 20th century approach to, to its employees, it might be them. But they recognize, no, the employees that we have, they are the first people that the customer sees. If our workers are surly, this is going to have an effect on, on customer satisfaction. So what I found was interesting was that it I wasn't something which is only in certain industries and not others. I found it to be quite consistent across the industry. Professor Edmund, yeah, I wanted to get this uh, question in uh, before uh, before the end. We're we're uh, rapidly approaching the end of our time. We have uh, time for a few more questions, but I want to make sure and get this question in, which is, how do we teach uh, the the next generation of business leaders who are our business students? You and I, and a lot of the faculty who are watching this webinar, uh, I think I want I think want to know this. You know, it's one thing to uh, uh, to to um, set incentives like you just uh, described to get. Um, the, the older folks who are running these corporations today to change their ways, but a much more uh, powerful thing is to get um, get uh, business students, um, you know, uh, educated in understanding this growing the pie and, and other and other uh, related ideas before they hit the business world where they have 30, 40 years to make a difference. What what should business? What can business students? Uh, how can, how can we teach them? And what can business students do themselves to be proactive in learning about uh, learning about ESG and the effect on share price? That's my answer being a professor, but I think this is the role of, of education, but education from the undergraduate level. So um, you might be familiar with this textbook, Principles of Corporate Finance by Greeley, Myers and Allen. So this was the seen as the Bible of finance for, for decades. It's been around since 1980. When I was an undergrad, I read it. When I was at Morgan Stanley, we all had it on our bookshelves. Um, I've just become a co-author of that book. So I'll be writing the, I'm currently writing the 14th edition. And so I'm putting a big responsibility component into that so we understand that actually these things are not fluffy optional extras but they're consistent with long-term profitability but in addition to that i think there's a lot of good resources out there so um with gresham college i gave a lecture series called 
how business can better serve society. So there's some free lectures on that topic that I've given. But I think more generally than, than, than just me, there are um, equity research teams now. So when I was at Morgan Stanley, there used to be a chemicals team, a banks team, but they now have a responsible business team, which re reduces a lot of re reports. And so some of them are available for free on, on the website. So now a lot of these materials are, are available and accessible. And so I think it's a question of just proactively going out and looking for it. What it is now is increasingly supported by data, because as was mentioned by uh, Nima's earlier question, this is one of the things which I think is really uh, becoming advanced now in responsibility. Uh, terrific. We, we, terrific. And we look forward to the, the new edition of uh, Breeley Myers, Allen, and uh, Edmonds. That's great. Yeah. Thanks, Ross. <laughs> yeah. Oh, see, here's a question submitted um, by um, our associate, senior associate dean. It is pretty much accepted that human progress must be accompanied by an by a usually substantially, substantial, excuse me, reduction in the human capital input to production, as we've seen. Is there any evidence that an approach that seeks to preserve a reasonable level of human input to production could yield the same or at least similar improvement in a company's profitability. Yeah, so I, I've not done any research myself on this, but um, there is a, a great TED talk by David Orter, who's a professor of economics at, at MIT, um, called, I think, Will Automation um, Destroy All of Our Jobs? And, and what he, he looked at there um, was there are certainly some technological changes which seem to get rid of workers, such as the ATM. And so he took the example of when the ATM was launched, there were a quarter of a million bank tellers in the US. And now that number's gone up to 500,000. And you might think, well, that's crazy because um, the ATM should reduce the human capital input to production. But in fact, what the banks did was they redefined uh, these bank tellers' jobs. So away from the basic aspect of just withdrawing and, and depositing money towards advising companies, uh, so advising customers on, well, you're in a low interest account here, you should move to this one. And that was actually more interesting um, for, um, for, for uh, the, the bank tellers themselves. And similarly, one might think this with, with say, administrative assistants. Well, they were typists, so now that function might go away, particularly if you've got voice recognition software. But now that job has expanded to executive assistants, which is um, much broader and also more fulfilling in, in other ways. So certainly that the challenge of, of automation is a serious one and we can't just dismiss it. But I tend to take a little bit of a more optimistic viewpoint is that if we think practically about redefining jobs towards ones which are particularly important with a human element, such as this financial advice component, which tenants can give, which people might not be comfortable with robots giving, I think there's still that aspect of preserving uh, humans here. Terrific. So I guess we don't have to worry about Terminator, the rise of the machines taking over the world, at least not for the present. Nima, do you, I, I have other questions, but I'll, I'll turn it over to you uh, as time is rapidly running out. Definitely. So um, we've had a few different questions that I want to combine into one for you, Professor Edmonds, with the baseline being materiality. So we've had some questions about the role of business during Black Lives Matter and systemic racism. We've had questions regarding the role of business with climate change, and we've had questions with uh, the role of business in COVID-19. And with materiality, you had mentioned if a company is focusing on multiple facets at the same time, it might not be the best way to grow the total pie. However, going back to the Vodafone example at the beginning, if a company does not acknowledge one of these three crises, there will be media backlash. How would you recommend for corporations to tackle all three of these issues while not compromising materiality at the same time? Yeah, so so this is this is a tricky question, an important one. So that there will be some balance here um, and so um, certainly something such as um, Black Lives Matter and diversity more generally which goes beyond just just race companies should I think address that to the extent to which they can do so from within so if this involves um, making sure that they are um, promoting people um, regardless of of, of um of demographic background or, or actually being positively um, affirmative towards uh, diversity that matters if they're also ensuring diversity of thought by creating a culture that encourages dissent, that's also valuable because that's something which a company affects directly. What I'd be more, more skeptical about is companies doing things such as making massive donations to Black Lives Matter. Well, I really think that this movement's a very important one, but I think it's sort of too easy just to write a check. And if instead of doing that donation, they could do two things. Number one, in something which uh, 
affects a more material stakeholder. So that would be a Vodafone investing in the equivalent of an m which I think is, is, is better because it's linked more to the business. Or instead of that, they could pay out higher wages to workers or higher dividends to shareholders and allow the shareholders to go donate to whatever cause that they want to. Because it might be that you and I are both investors in a company. I care about Black Lives Matter, but you care more about cancer research, and maybe you would want to give the, your, the wages or the dividends to American Cancer Society. So this is where, um, again, it's not for maybe a CEO to decide which causes to support, but it could be actually down to workers or individual shareholders. So I think all of those things, if it's something that you are able to control directly, because you've got much greater control over, say, your carbon footprint, or you can affect the culture of your organization, I would say do it. But if it is um, donating to charity, something that shareholders or workers could themselves do, I don't think that's something that you have. If it goes to a comparative advantage, what are you uniquely placed to, to solve? Thank great, you. Professor. Yeah, great, Professor Edmonds. I have one more question here, and then I'll uh, invite Nima if he has more questions uh, as we're running out of time. But uh, you know the term, uh, Professor Edmonds, uh, greenwashing, kind of a pejorative term uh, for uh, firms that are putting up a nice face, they're, they're window dressing, that they're doing uh, good. And uh, to, to a large extent, ESG to me seems like a, a problem based metric information. And, and you pointed it out with uh, Emmanuel the goat herder, is that there are certain things that the market sees and there are certain things the market doesn't see. My question is: Is um, do you, are you hopeful that um, the, the the ESG ratings are getting better, and that uh, that uh, these ratings, um, as metrics of true dedication to these material items, um, are are getting better and better by MSCI and whoever, and that uh, corporations will ultimately be uh, you know separated out between those who really are and those who really aren't. I think the metrics will get better, but I still am skeptical that the metrics will never be perfect and there will always be an element of greenwashing because metrics, by their very nature, they have to be quantitative. So it's much easier for a company to improve the pay of its employees than to provide them with meaningful work or opportunities to step up. And so that's why I will say that, that I don't think there will ever be a replacement of, of human input to, to Mike's earlier question is that even if we have the best possible metrics, I don't think we will truly replace the boots on the ground approach of getting out and talking to management. So in the book, I have these eight questions which were developed by Blueprint for Better Business, which is a UK institution, which are, comes up with questions that investors should ask management to get around the issue of the fact that there's these greenwashing um, ideas. So one of them is to ask managers, tell me about your people, are there specific concerns that they have and how have you addressed them? And so there's some CEOs who say, oh, I can answer this. And there's others who say, I didn't know that you're going to ask me about my people. Next time I'm going to bring along the HR director. So that actually is quite telling because it says, well, who are the CEOs who really care about this and who are the ones who think it's just an HR issue? So the old boots on the ground idea of speaking to management, I think, will never go away. And I'm again putting into the chat. This um, journal, which um, a investor has written, they're responsible. It's called 12 Countries in 12 Months. It does exactly what it says on the tin. These investors will refuse to invest into a company unless they've looked management in the eye and seen the factories. And you might think, well, for these meetings, the investor relations department would have prepped management on how to answer. But what they show is them, so even the most basic questions are actually really telling. And you can see through all the greenwash in the reports. Nima, do you have uh, more questions on your end? Uh, the only other thing, I, an open-ended question for you, Professor Edmonds, for the students who are hearing these great theories that you're sharing, and as they're looking for their next enterprise, their next career opportunity, what words of wisdom would you give them in their job hunts, in their corporate selections, and as they graduate from the University of Maryland Smith School? So I, I think um, it would just, again, be the idea of, of purpose and profit not necessarily being mis misaligned. So we often think, oh, well, we can um, start uh, our career by going to the most lucrative career and then just thinking about purpose later. But I, I think it's something that would, is important just to start from, from, from the outset. Um, and actually, one of my Gresham lectures was one called Finding Purpose in Your Career, 
which is something which um, is hopefully highlighting the fact that purposeful companies, sorry, purposeful jobs can also be of jobs. It's not necessarily a trade of things. So, so let me just give an example of my former job in investment banking. So you might think, well, people who go into investment banking, they only care about making as much money as possible. But actually, what are you doing as an investment banker? You're giving companies trusted advice. So a company comes to you with their biggest problem. Right, so they're in trouble. Do they issue debt? Do they sell equity? Do they sell a division? And you are trusted to give them the advice which is best for them, not the one that is going to give you the highest fee. So, if you are a person who really loves giving trusted advice, maybe you're the person in your friendship group who is willing to have tough conversations with other people and hold them accountable, maybe you would actually find this to be a purposeful and fulfilling career. Whereas there's others who don't like to have those conversations. You find them awkward, and if so, don't go into investment banking, no matter how much you get paid, no matter how prestigious the job is, because if your whole soul and what you're passionate about is not being a trusted advisor and having those tough conversations, you're going to probably find it difficult to, to, to go into investment banking. Thanks so much, Professor Edmonds. I'll pass it back to you, Russ. To... Yeah. yeah, thank you, uh, Nima. Uh, it's, uh, this has been a great hour uh, with uh, Professor Edmonds. Um, I, I appreciate it very much, uh, Alex. And uh, on behalf of the CSVC, uh, the Center for Financial Policy, um, and the Smith School of Business at University of Maryland, uh, we really appreciate your um, coming online today and talking with us. Um, the book is Grow the Pie, How Great Companies Deliver Both Purpose and Profit. I know that I've learned a lot today from uh, Professor Edmonds' uh, talk and uh, addressing questions. Uh, the, the man is Professor Alex Edmonds, um, as I said, a superstar professor at the London Business School. Um, I'm looking forward, um, Alex, to um, having having dinner with you when uh, this crisis dies out and we can discuss all this further. But thank you so much for your uh, participation and your time today. Well, thank you so much to everybody for hosting and thank you for all the participants. And, and if you had questions and I didn't get time to answer them, please do drop me a note on LinkedIn. I, I guarantee to answer all the questions that people pose at me. So thank you so much. I appreciate the interest and sorry that we weren't able to get through to all of them. But thank you once again to uh, the two centers for hosting. It, it's been really a, a lot of pleasure. Terrific. And uh, thanks to all our viewers. I will copy the links that uh, Professor Edmonds has posted on chat and uh, uh, circulate them to uh, at least to some people that you that can circulate it to you uh, if you attend it in case you want to look at the uh, links after this uh, chat after this webinar window has been closed thank you uh, professor edmonds and have a great evening in london thanks for us thanks Nima. thanks kristen thank you everybody